Hello everyone, this is Thersites the Historian, and today I'm returning to H.G. Wells' The Outline of History to look at his treatment of what he calls the mechanical and industrial revolutions, but which most scholars today call the first and second industrial revolutions. This, in my opinion, is probably Wells' greatest work. This is a topic where he has a lot of passion and he has put a lot of thought into what made the modern world what it is. He very much has a materialist view of history and of causation, one which I largely agree with, as I've stated in the past. If anything, he maybe overestimates materiality and underestimates ideas, but I think in general that he's correct that ideas stem from the lived experience caused by materiality. So he is a, he's really engaging in a pretty common debate that all historians will end up having to confront at some point or other. Effectively, what he argues when he describes what he calls the mechanical revolution is that it was this period when things such as the steamship and the telegraph were invented, which fundamentally changed the way that people lived and changed the scale of possibility so much that it literally changed everything else along with it. I think that this view is basically correct, so far as I can tell. He says that the 19th century brought about the greatest changes in human experience. And while, as someone who studies the ancient world, I'd like to try to make an argument for an earlier period, once again, I find myself unable to really do so. I do have to warn you, though, this is a very, very British take on the whole topic, as he begins this entire section by dismissing the contributions of Napoleon and the political significance of the French Revolution. I think that, once again, he does underestimate the importance of ideas, and that's part of the problem, but it's also just him being very, very British and wanting to cut the French out as much as possible. So, he says at one point that there are a lot of people that he knows who dismiss the changes in scale when it comes to the size of buildings or the tonnage of ships as merely a surface level change that makes no difference. And he says this only shows the limitations of these people's intellects. Because if you're changing things on that level, if materials now allow you to do things that were unimaginable before, this is a fundamental change. This is the unlocking of the mind in many ways. And this means that things are changing in ways that are very hard to predict. Effectively, in the first section, he ends by arguing that Britain and, by extension, America and other countries that he is in favor of need to spend more time, money, and effort educating kids and adults in science and technology. So basically, he would be very happy if he were to see the state of education now, which is heavily centered upon STEM. Although as a man of letters, maybe he'd think it had gone too far. At any rate, the men of letters of his time were fairly dismissive of what they saw as the mechanical or vulgar arts, and clearly there's some conflict there between Wells and such people. I have to imagine, given what we know and what we've talked about on this channel in the past, that Hilaire Bellick was one such man. Uh, Wells talked specifically about the ecclesiastical types really trying to hold back national and university research into science. And I imagine that Bellick was very much the kind of guy who was not a big fan of spending money on science. Wells also showing the temper of his age, talks about how Germany pulled ahead in a lot of scientific endeavors and basically tries to raise an alarm bell talking about how Germany is really advanced in chemistry and how they spend more money and take better care of their inventors. So it's really an interesting section and it gives you a portrait both of the historical period, but also how someone in 1920 was already aware of the huge importance of all of these inventions and also their applications to war. He doesn't go into that in great detail, but the implication would have been very, very blatant to an audience which just lived through World War I. Remember, this was published in 1920. In the second section, he talks about, effectively, the Industrial Revolution, that is to say, the use of large-scale factories. I really love this section even more. Wells argues that 
Effectively, this was not the first time this had happened. The Roman Republic, he says, had already done something similar and had some very large capitalistic enterprises. And at the time, this view was probably somewhat laughed at, or at least not really taken too seriously. And it was the belief until the last two or three decades that the ancient world didn't really have much industry in the modern sense of the word. However, in the last couple of decades, due to both new material findings and more in-depth reading of financial transaction records that we have from the ancient world, it's become clear that there were large-scale economic activities and that rich people in classical Athens and in the late Roman Republic were dealing with some fairly complicated financial affairs, that banking was more sophisticated than simple pawn shops or whatever the old view was, and that uh, there was mass-scale production. There was a shield factory in Athens run by Nicias's family, for instance, and there was also um, there are also factories in the Roman world. There's also, uh, Wells didn't know about this, and he explicitly says something incorrect talking about how there weren't water wheels. But we've recently found evidence of water wheels in the late Roman Empire. We also know that there were arms factories in Rome. And as I mentioned, there were already arms factories in Athens. So Wells is 100% correct to point out that what produced the Industrial Revolution is not machinery, but rather just the concentration of capital and the ability of people to hire en masse, which is also aided by population growth. But he says that what really shaped this one to be different than the late Republic is that these machines were there and that machines were more efficient than men so that you couldn't just use men as slave labor or as nearly slave labor. You had to get a little more creative, hence the birth of mass education. And also the development of new technologies which for commercial use. So um, really, I think that he came across here as bringing things together. He really stitches things together pretty neatly. And um, like I said, very impressed by this. He also brings up Marx at the very end of his section and in future readings, we'll go more into Wells' thoughts on Marx. What's interesting about Wells is that while he is generally sympathetic to Marx, he is by no means doctrinaire, which I guess is fairly typical of a historian, someone who is usually fairly eclectic in their worldview to begin with. And uh, he starts out with a critique that Marx was careless in his terminology. Now, many Marxists really debate over terminology to, to a slavish extent, and Wells basically sees those disputes as rather stupid. He said, look, Marx was careless with his language at times when he said, class what he meant was this when he said this word what he actually meant was that um so that part pay attention to it it will come at the end of this section anyhow those are my general thoughts on what wells has to say so listen to the rest of this video hear what wells has to say from his perspective and then let me know what you think in the comments chapter 37 the Realities and Imaginations of the 19th Century Section 1. The Mechanical Revolution The career and personality of Napoleon I bulks disproportionately in the 19th century histories. He was of little significance to the broad onward movement of human affairs. He was an interruption, a reminder of latent evils, a thing like the bacterium of some pestilence. Even regarded as a pestilence, he was not of supreme rank. He killed far fewer people than the influenza epidemic of 1918, and produced less political and social disruption than the plague of Justinian. Some such interlude had to happen, and some such patched-up settlement of Europe as the concert of Europe, because there was no worked-out system of ideas upon which a new world could be constructed. And even the concert of Europe, had in it an element of progress. It did at least set aside the individualism of Machiavellian monarchy and declare that there was a human, or at any rate, a European common will. If it divided the world among the kings, it made respectful gestures towards human unity and the service of God and man.
the permanently effective task before mankind, which had to be done before any new and enduring social and political edifice was possible, the task upon which the human intelligence is, with many interruptions and amidst much anger and turmoil, still engaged, was and is the task of working out and applying a science of property as a basis for freedom and social justice, a science of currency to ensure and preserve an efficient economic medium, a science of government and collective operations, whereby in every community man may learn to pursue their common interest in harmony, a science of world politics, through which the stark waste and cruelty of warfare between races, peoples, and nations may be brought to an end, and the common interest of mankind brought under a common control, and above all, a worldwide system of education to sustain the will and interest of men in their common human adventure. The real makers of history in the 19th century, the people whose consequences will be determining human life a century ahead, were those who advanced and contributed to this fivefold constructive effort. Compared to them, the foreign ministers and statesmen and politicians of this period were no more than a number of troublesome and occasionally incendiary schoolboys, and a few metal thieves playing about and doing transitory mischief amidst the accumulating materials upon the site of a great building whose nature they did not understand. And while throughout the 19th century the mind of Western civilization, which the Rena Renaissance had released, gathered itself to the task of creative social and political reconstruction that still lies before it, there swept across the world a wave of universal change in human power and the material conditions of life that the first scientific efforts of that liberated mind had made possible. The prophecies of Roger Bacon began to live in reality. The accumulating knowledge and confidence of the little succession of men who had been carrying on uh, the development of science now began to bear fruit that common men could understand. The most obvious first fruit was the steam engine. The first steam engines in the, in the 18th century were pumping engines used to keep water out of the newly opened coal mines. These coal mines were being worked to supply coke for iron smelting, for which wood charcoal had previously been employed. It was James Watt, a mathematical instrument maker of Glasgow, who improved this steam pumping engine and made it available for the driving of machinery. The first engine so employed was installed in a cotton mill in Nottingham in 1785. In 1804, Trevithick adapted the Watt engine to transport and made the first locomotive. In 1825, the first railway between Stockton and Darlington was opened for traffic. The original engine, Locomotion No. 1, 1825, still adorns Darlington platform. By the middle of the century, a network of railways had spread all over Europe. Here was a sudden change in what had long been a fixed condition of human life, the maximum rate of land transport. After the Russian disaster, Napoleon traveled from near Vilna to Paris in 312 hours. This was a journey of about 1,400 miles. He was traveling with every conceivable advantage, and he averaged under 5 miles an hour. An ordinary traveler could not have done this distance in twice the time. These were about the same maximum rates of travel as held good between Rome and Gaul in the 1st century AD, or between Sardis and Susa in the 4th century BC. Then suddenly came a tremendous change. The railways reduced this journey for any average traveler to less than 48 hours. That is to say, they reduced the chief European distances to about a tenth of what they had been. They made it possible to carry out administrative work in areas ten times as great as any that had hit hereto been workable under one administration. The full significance of that possibility in Europe still remains to be realized. Europe is still netted in boundaries drawn in the horse and road era. In America, the effects were immediate. To the United States of America sprawling westward, it meant the possibility of a continuous access to Washington, however far the frontier traveled across the continent. It meant unity, sustained on a scale that would otherwise have been impossible. The steamboat was, if anything, a little ahead of the steam engine in its earlier phases. There was a steamboat, the Charlotte Dundas, on the Forth and Clyde Canal 
in 1802. In 1807, an American named Fulton had a paying steamer, the Claremont, with British-built engines upon the Hudson River above New York. The first steamship to put the sea was also an American, the Phoenix, which went from New York, Hoboken, to Philadelphia. So too was the first steamship using the first ship using steam, shall said sails, to cross the Atlantic, the Savannah, 1819. All these were paddle wheel boats, and paddle wheel boats are not adapted to work in heavy seas. The paddles smash too easily, and the boat is then disabled. The screw steamship followed rather slowly. Many difficulties had to be surmounted before the screw was a practicable thing. Not until the middle of the century did the tonnage of steamships upon the sea begin to overhaul that of sailing ships. After that, the evolution in sea transport was rapid. For the first time, men began to cross the sea and oceans with some certainty as to the date of their arrival. The transatlantic crossing, which had been an uncertain adventure of several weeks, which might stretch to months, was accelerated until in 1910 it was brought down, in the case of the fastest boats, to under five days, with a practically notifiable hour of arrival. All over the seas, there was the same reduction in the time and the same increase in the certainty of human communications. Concurrently with the development of steam transport upon sea and land, a new and striking addition to the facilities of human intercourse arose out of the investigations of Volta, Galvani, and Faraday into various electrical phenomena. The electric telegraph came into existence in 1835. The first underseas cable was laid in 1851 between France and England. In a few years, the telegraph system had spread over the civilized world, and news which had hitherto traveled slowly from point to point became practically simultaneous throughout the earth. These things, the steam railway and the electric telegraph, were to the popular imagination of the middle 19th century the most striking and revolutionary of inventions, but they were only the most conspicuous and clumsy first fruits of a far more extensive process. Technical knowledge and skill were developing with an extraordinary rapidity and to an extraordinary extent, measured by the progress of any previous age. Far less conspicuous at first in everyday life, but finally far more important, was the extension of man's power over various structural materials. Before the middle of the 18th century, iron was reduced from its ores by means of wood charcoal, was handled in small pieces, and hammered and wrought into shape. It was material for a craftsman. Quality and treatment were enormously dependent upon the experience and sagacity of the individual iron worker. The largest masses of iron that could be dealt with under those conditions amounted at most, in the 16th century, to two or three tons. There was a very definite upward limit, therefore, to the size of cannon. The blast furnace arose in the 18th century and developed with the use of coke. Not before the 18th century do we find rolled sheet iron, 1728, and rolled rods and bars, 1783. Naismith's steam hammer came out as late as 1839. The ancient world, because of its metallurgical inferiority, could not use steam. The steam engine, even the primitive pumping engine, could not develop before sheet iron was available. The early engines seemed to the modern eye very pitiful and clumsy bits of ironmongery, but they were the utmost that the metallurgical science of the time could do. As late as 1856 came the Bessemer process, and presently, 1864, the open hearth process, in which steel and every sort of iron could be melted, purified, and cast in a manner, and upon a scale hit hereto unheard of. Today, in the electric furnace, one may see tons of incandescent steel swirling about like boiling milk in a saucepan. Nothing in the previous practical advances of mankind is comparable in its consequences to the complete mastery over enormous masses of steel and iron and over their texture and quality which man has now achieved. The railways and early engines of all sorts were the mere first triumphs of the new metallurgical methods. Presently came ships of iron and steel, vast bridges and a new way of building with steel upon a gigantic scale. Men realized too late that they had planned their railways with far too timid a gauge that they could have organized their traveling with far more steadiness and comfort 
upon a much bigger scale. Before the 19th century, there were no ships in the world much over 2,000 tons burthen. Now there is nothing wonderful about a 50,000 ton liner. There are people who sneer at this kind of progress as being a progress in mere size, but that sort of sneering merely masks the intellectual, marks the intellectual limitations of those who indulge in it. The great ship or the steel frame building is not, as they imagine, a magnified version of the small ship or building of the past. It is a thing different in kind, more lightly and strongly built, of finer and stronger materials. Instead of being a thing of precedent and rule of thumb, it is a thing of subtle and intricate calculation. In the old house or ship, matter was dominant. The material and its needs had to be slavishly obeyed. In the new, matter has been captured, changed, coerced. Think of the coal and iron and sand dragged out of the banks and pits, wrenched, wrought, molten, and cast, to be flung at last, a slender, glittering pinnacle of steel and glass, 600 feet above the crowded city. We have given these particulars of the advance in, man, in man's knowledge of the metallurgy of steel and its results by way of illustration. A parallel story could be told of the metallurgy of copper and tin and a multitude of metals, nickel and aluminum to name but two, unknown before the 19th century dawned. It is in this great and growing mastery over substances, over different sorts of glass, over rocks and plasters and the like, over colors and textures, that the main triumphs of the mechanical revolution have thus far been achieved. Yet we are still in the stage of the first fruits in the matter. We have the power, but we have to learn how to use our power. Many of the first employments of these gifts of science have been vulgar, tawdry, stupid, or horrible. The artist and the adapter have still hardly begun to work with the endless variety of substances now at their disposal. Parallel with this extension of mechanical possibilities, the new science of electricity grew up. It was only in the 80s of the 19th century that this body of inquiry began to yield results to impress the vulgar mind. Then suddenly came electric light and electric traction, and the transmutation of forces, the possibility of sending power that could be changed into mechanical motion, or light, or heat, as one chose, along a copper wire, as water is sent along a pipe, began to come through to the ideas of ordinary people. The British and the French were at first the leading peoples in this great proliferation of knowledge, but presently the Germans, who had learnt humility under Napoleon, showed such zeal and pertinacity in, in scientific inquiry as to overhaul these leaders. British science was largely the creation of Englishmen and Scotchmen, working outside the ordinary centers of erudition. We have told how in England the universities after the Reformation ceased to have a wide popular appeal, how they became the educational preserve of the nobility and gentry, and the strongholds of the established church. A pompous and unintelligent classical pretentiousness dominated them, and they dominated the schools of the middle and upper classes. The only knowledge recognized was an uncritical textual knowledge of a selection of Latin and Greek classics, and the test of a good style was its abundance of quotations, allusions, and stereotyped expressions. The early development of British school of British science went on, therefore, in spite of the formal educational organization, and in the, in the teeth of the bitter hostility of the teaching and clerical professions. French education, too, was dominated by the classical tradition of the Jesuits, and consequently, it was not difficult for the Germans to organize a body of investigators, small indeed in relation to the possibilities of the case, but large in proportion to the little band of British and French inventors and experimentalists. And though this work of research and experiment was making Britain and France the most rich and powerful countries in the world, it was not making scientific and inventive men rich and powerful. There is a necessary unworldliness about a sincere scientific man. He is too preoccupied with his research to plan and scheme how to make money out of it. The economic exploitation of his discoveries falls very easily and naturally, therefore, into the hands of a more acquisitive type. And so we find that the crops of rich men which every fresh phase of scientific and technical progress has produced in Great Britain though they have not displayed quite the same passionate desire to insult and kill the goose that laid the national golden eggs as the scholastic and clerical professions, 
have been quite content to let that profitable creature starve. Inventors and discoverers come by nature, they think, for cleverer people to profit by. In this matter, the Germans were a little wiser. The German learned did not display the same vehement hatred of the new learning. They permitted its development. The German businessman and manufacturer, again, had not quite the same contempt for the man of science as had his British competitor. Knowledge, these Germans believed, might be a cultivated crop, responsive to fertilizers. They did concede, therefore, a certain amount of opportunity to the scientific mind. Their public expenditure on scientific work was relatively greater, and this expenditure was abundantly rewarded. By the latter half of the 19th century, the German scientific worker had made German a necessary language for every science student who wished to keep abreast with the latest work in his department. And in certain branches, and particularly in chemistry, Germany acquired a very great superiority over her Western neighbors. The scientific effort of the 60s and 70s in Germany began to tell after the 80s, and the Germans gained steadily upon Britain and France in technical and industrial prosperity. In an outline of history such as this, it is impossible to trace the network of complex mental processes that led to the incessant extension of knowledge and power that is now going on. All we can do here is to call the reader's attention to the most salient turning points that finally led the toboggan of human affairs into its present swift ice run of progress. We have told of the first release of human curiosity and of the beginnings of systematic inquiry and experiment. We have told, too, how when the plutocratic Roman system and its resultant imperialism had come and gone again, this process of inquiry was renewed. We have told of the escape of investigation from ideas of secrecy and personal advantage to the idea of publication and a brotherhood of knowledge, and we have noted the foundation of the British Royal Society, the Florentine Society, and their like as a consequence of the socializing of thought. These things were the roots of the mechanical revolution, and so long as the root of pure scientific inquiry lives, that revolution will progress. The mechanical revolution itself began, we may say, with the exhaustion of the wood supply for the ironworks of England. This led to the use of coal. The coal mine led to the simple pumping engine. The development of the pumping engine by Watt into a machine driving engine led on to the locomotive and the steamship. This was the first phase of a great expansion in the use of steam. A second phase in the mechanical revolution began with the application of electrical science to practical problems and the development of electric lighting, power transmission, and traction. A third phase is to be distinguished when, in the 80s, a new type of engine came into use, an engine in which the expansive force of an explosive mixture replaced the expansive force of steam. The light, highly efficient, engines that were thus made possible were applied to the automobile and developed at last to reach such a pitch of lightness and efficiency as to render flight long known to be possible a practical achievement the work of the wright brothers in america was of primary importance in this field a flying machine but not a machine large enough to take up a human body was made by professor langley of the smithsonian institute of washington as early as 1897 his next effort, a full-sized aeroplane, failed on its early trials, but after very extensive alterations, was successfully flown by Curtis a few years later. By 1909, the aeroplane was widely available for human locomotion, or just available, actually. There had seemed to be a pause in the increase of human speed with the perfection of railways and automobile road traction, with the flying machine came fresh reductions in the effective distance between one place on the Earth's surface and another. In the 18th century, the distance from London to Edinburgh was an eight days journey. In 1918, the British Civil Air Transport Commission reported that the journey from London to Melbourne, halfway around the world, would probably, in a few years' time, be accomplished in that same period of eight days. Too much stress must not be laid upon these striking reductions in the time distances of one place from another. They are merely one aspect of a much profounder and more momentous enlargement of human possibility. The science of agriculture and agricultural chemistry, for instance, made quite parallel advances during the 19th century. 
Men learnt so to fertilize the soil as to produce quadruple and quintuple the crops got from the same area in the 17th century. There was a still more extraordinary advance in medical science. The average duration of life rose. The daily efficiency increased. The waste of life through ill health diminished. Now, here altogether, we have such a change in human life as to constitute a fresh phase of history. In little more than a century, this mechanical revolution has been brought about. In that time, man has made a stride in the material conditions in his life faster than he had done during the whole long interval between the Paleolithic stage and the age of cultivation, or between the days of Pepi in Egypt and those of George III. A new gigantic material framework for human affairs has come into existence. Clearly, it demands great readjustments of our social, economical, and political methods. But these readjustments have necessarily waited upon the development of the mechanical revolution, and they are still only in their opening stage today. Section 2. Relation of the Mechanical and Industrial Revolutions There is a tendency in many histories to confuse together what we have here called the mechanical revolution which was an entirely new thing in human experience arising out of the development of organized science. A new step, like the invention of agriculture or the discovery of metals, with something else quite different in its origins, something for which there was already an historical precedent, the social and financial development, which is called the Industrial Revolution. The two processes were going on together. They were constantly reacting upon one another, but they were in root and essence different. There would have been an industrial revolution of sorts if there had been no coal, no steam, no machinery, but in that case it would probably have followed far more closely upon the lines of the social and financial developments of the later years of the Roman Republic. It would have repeated the story of dispossessed free cultivators, gang labor, great estates, great financial fortunes, and a socially destructive financial process. Even the factory method came before power and machinery. Factories were the product, not of machinery, but of the, quote, division of labor. Drilled and sweated workers were making such things as millinery, cardboard boxes and furniture, and coloring maps and book illustrations, and so forth, before even water wheels had been used for industrial processes. There were factories in Rome in the days of Augustus. New books, for instance, were dictated to rows of copyists and the factories of the booksellers. The attentive student of Defoe and of the political pamphlets of Fielding will realize that the idea of herding poor people into establishments to work collectively for their living was already current in Britain before the close of the 17th century. There are intimations of it even as early as Moore's Utopia, 1516. It was a social and not a mechanical development. Up to past the middle of the 18th century, the social and economic history of Western Europe was, in fact, retreading the path along which the Roman state had gone in the last three centuries BC. America was in many ways a new Spain, and India and China a new Egypt. But the political disunions of Europe and political convulsions against monarchy, the recalcitrance of the common folk, and perhaps also the greater accessibility of the Western European intelligence to mechanical ideas and inventions turned the process into quite novel directions. Ideas of human solidarity, thanks mainly to Christianity, were far more widely diffused in this newer European world. Political power was not so concentrated, and the man of energy anxious to get rich turned his mind, therefore, very willingly from the ideas of the slave and of gang labor to the idea of mechanical power and the machine. The mechanical revolution, the process of mechanical invention and discovery, was a new thing in human experience, and it went on regardless of the social, political, economic, and industrial consequences it might produce. The industrial revolution, on the other hand, like most other human affairs, was and is more and more profoundly changed and deflected by the constant variation in human conditions caused by the mechanical revolution. And the essential difference between the amassing of riches, the extinction of small farmers and small businessmen, and the phase of big finance in the latter centuries of the Roman Republic on the one hand, 
and the very similar concentration of capital in the 18th and 19th centuries on the other lies in the profound difference in the character of labor that the mechanical revolution was bringing about. The power of the old world was human power. Everything depended ultimately upon the driving power of human muscle, the muscle of ignorant and subjected men. A little animal muscle, supplied by draft oxen, horse traction, and the like, contributed. Where a weight had to be lifted, men lifted it. Where a rock had to be quarried, men shipped it out. Where a field had to be plowed, men and oxen plowed it. The Roman equivalent of the steamship was the galley, with its banks of sweating rowers. A vast proportion of mankind in the early civilizations was employed in purely mechanical drudgery. At its onset, power-driven machinery did not seem to promise any release from such unintelligent toil. Great gangs of men were employed in excavating canals, in making railway cuttings and embankments, and the like. The number of miners increased enormously, but the extension of facilities and the output of commodities increased much more. And as the 19th century went on, the plain logic of the new situation asserted itself more clearly. Human beings were no longer wanted as a source of mere indiscriminated power. What could be done mechanically by a human being could be done faster and better by a machine. The human being was needed now only where choice and intelligence had to be exercised. Human beings were wanted only as human beings. The drudge on whom all previous civilizations had rested, the creature of mere obedience, the man whose brains were superfluous, had become unnecessary to the welfare of mankind. This was as true of such ancient industries as agriculture and mining as it was of the newest metallurgical processes. For plowing, sowing, and harvesting, swift machines came forward to do the work of scores of men. Here America led the old world. The Roman civilization was built upon cheap and degraded human beings. Modern civilization is being rebuilt upon cheap mechanical power. For a hundred years, power has been getting cheaper and labor dearer. If for a generation or so, machinery has had to wait its turn in the mine, it is simply because for a time, men were cheaper than machinery. In Northumberland and Durham, in the early days of coal mining, they were, so cheaply, they were so cheaply esteemed that it was unusual to hold inquest on the bodies of men killed in mine disasters. Trade unionism was needed to alter that state of affairs. But this general trend towards the supplementing and supersession of manual labor by machinery was a changeover of quite primary importance in human affairs. The chief solicitude of the rich and of the ruler in the old civilization had been to keep up a supply of drudges. There was no other source of wealth. As the 19th century went on, it became more and more plain to the intelligent, directive people that the common man had now to do something better than be a drudge. He had to be educated, if only to secure, quote, industrial efficiency. He had to understand what he was about. From the days of the first Christian propaganda, popular education had been smoldering in Europe, just as it has smoldered in Asia wherever Islam has set its foot, because of the necessity of making the believer understand a little of the belief by which he is saved, and of enabling him to read a little in the sacred books by which his belief is conveyed. Christian controversies, with their competition for adherence, plowed the ground for the harvest of popular education. In England, for instance, by the 30s and 40s of the 19th century, the disputes of the sex and the necessity of catching adherents young had produced an abundance of night schools, Sunday schools, and a series of competing educational organizations for children. The undenominational British schools, the church national schools, and even Roman Catholic elementary schools. The earlier less enlightened manufacturers, unable to take a broad view of their own interest, hated and opposed these schools. But here again, Needy Germany led her richer neighbors. The religious teacher in Britain presently found the prophet seeker at his side, unexpectedly eager to get the commonality, if not the educated, at least trained to a higher level of economic efficiency.
The second half of the 19th century was a period of rapid advance in popular education throughout all the westernized world. There was no parallel advance in the education of the upper classes, some advance, no doubt, but nothing to correspond, and so the great gulf that had divided the world hit hereto into the readers and the non-reading mass became little more than a slightly perceptible difference in educational level. At the back of this process was the mechanical revolution, apparently regardless of social conditions, but really insisting inexorably upon the complete abolition of a totally illiterate class throughout the world. The economic revolution of the Roman Republic had never been clearly apprehended by the common people of Rome. The ordinary Roman citizen never saw the changes through which he lived clearly and comprehensively as we see them. But the Industrial Revolution, as it went on towards the end of the 19th century, was more and more distinctly seen as one whole process by the common people it was affecting, because presently they could read and discuss and communicate, and because they went about and saw things as no commonality had ever done before. In this outline of history, we have been careful to indicate the gradual appearance of the ordinary people as a class with a will and ideas in common. It is the writer's belief that massive movements of the ordinary people over considerable areas only became possible as a result of the propagandist religions, Christianity and Islam, and their insistence upon individual self-respect. We have cited the enthusiasm of the commonality for the First Crusade as marking a new phase in social history. But before the 19th century, even these massive movements were comparatively restricted. The equalitarian insurrections of the peasantry from the Wycliffe period onward were confined to the peasant communities of definite localities. They spread only slowly into districts affected by similar forces. The town artisan rioted, indeed, but only locally. The chateau burning of the French Revolution was not the act of a peasantry who had overthrown a government. It was the act of a peasantry released by the overthrow of a government. The Commune of Paris was the first effective appearance of the town artisan as a political power, and the Parisian crowd of the First Revolution was a very mixed, primitive thinking, and savage crowd compared with any Western European crowd after 1830. But the Mechanical Revolution was not only pressing education upon the whole population, it was leading to a big capitalism and to a large-scale reorganization of, society, of industry that was to produce a new and distinctive system of ideas in the common people in the place of the mere uncomfortable recalcitrance and elemental rebellions of an illiterate commonality. We have already noted how the Industrial Revolution had split the manufacturing class, which had hit hereto been a middling and various sort of class, into two sections. The employers, who became rich enough to mingle with the financial, merchandising, and landowning classes, and the employees, who drifted to a status closer and closer to that of a of mere gang and agricultural labor. As the manufacturing employee sank, the agricultural laborer, by the introduction of agricultural machinery and the increase in his individual productivity, rose. By the middle of the 19th century, Karl Marx, 1818-1883, a German Jew of great scholarly attainments, was pointing out that the organization of the working classes by the steadily concentrating group of capitalist owners was developing a new social classification to replace the more complex class systems of the past. Property, so far as it was power, was being gathered together into relatively few hands, the hands of the big rich men, the capitalist class. While there was a great mingling of workers with little or no property, whom he called the expropriated or proletariat, a misuse of this word, who were bound to develop a common class consciousness of the conflict of their interest with those of the rich men. Differences of education and tradition between the various older social elements, which were in a process of being fused up into the new class of the expropriated, seemed for a time to contradict this sweeping generalization. The traditions of the professions, the small employers, the farmer, peasant, and the like, were all different from one another and from the various craftsman traditions of the workers. But with the spread of education and the cheapening of literature, this Marxian generalization becomes now more and more acceptable. These classes, 
who were linked at first by nothing but a common impoverishment, were and are being reduced or raised to the same standard of life, forced to read the same books and share the same inconveniences. A sense of solidarity between all sorts of poor and propertyless men, as against the profit amassing and wealth concentrating class, is growing more and more evident in our world. Old differences fade away, the difference between craftsmen and open-air workers, between black coat and overall, between poor clergyman and elementary schoolmaster, between policeman and bus driver. They must all buy the same cheap furnishings and live in similar cheap houses. Their sons and daughters will all mingle and marry. Success at the upper level becomes more and more hopeless for the rank and file. Marx, who did not so much advocate the class war, the war of the expropriated mass against the appropriating few, as foretell it, is being more and more justified by events. It is sometimes argued against Marx that the proportion of people who have savings invested has increased in many modern communities. These savings are technically capital and their owners capitalist to that extent, and this is supposed to contradict the statement of Marx that property concentrates in the fewer and fewer hands. Marx used many of his terms carelessly and shows them ill, and his ideas were better than his words. When he wrote property, he meant property so far as it is power. The small investor has remarkably little power over his invested capital.